It's time to explore the furthest depths of the imagination with James Cameron's The Abyss, fantastical science fiction adventure. Which, instead of exploring our fascination with the stars, instead The Abyss goes down to the deepest depths of the ocean, capturing an equally compelling and spellbinding environment. Released in 1989, it tells the story of a drill team led by Bud, played by Ed Harris, who is bald. Along with his estranged wife, Lindsay, played by Mary Elizabeth Mansantonio, after a U.S. submarine sinks due to an encounter with a mysterious object. However, a Navy SEAL who has joined the crew, Coffee, played by Michael Biehn, has seemingly gone insane and is having a psychotic rampage. All while the underwater crew learns that the events taking place could, in fact, be the work of aliens who have abilities and physicalities far beyond our comprehension. Wow! Just wow! The behind the scenes of this movie is just insane. Now I've deep dived into some pretty troubled movie productions in my time, but this one just takes the wagon wheel. Not even SpongeBob Circle Trousers himself could save this one. So let's explore ten things that you didn't know about the abyss, while thanking the heavens that we didn't take part in making this beast. As we check it out. Number 10, The Deep Developments of the Abyss. The idea of what would eventually become the Abyss first hit James Cameron when he was still in high school, in which during a science lecture, Cameron learned about a deep sea diver who was able to breathe some kind of special liquid oxygen through his lungs. This tale of human achievement and intrigue prompted Cameron to write a story about a group of scientists who work in a lab at the bottom of the ocean. Jump to the mid 80s, and Cameron and his producer slash work colleague slash soon to be wife Gail Ann Hurd were working on the science fiction action classic Aliens. Round about this time, Cameron watched a National Geographic documentary about vehicles that are used in the deep in remote depths of the ocean. This caused Cameron to remember his story that he wrote when he was just 17, and to go back to it to make it his next movie after Aliens. Cameron also made changes to his original script. For example, instead of making the underwater team a group of scientists, he changed them to underwater truckers, much like how the workers in the original Alien movie were space truckers. These were basically underwater truckers. And just as with Aliens, 20th Century Fox were on board to back the movie, as now Cameron had directed both the Terminator and Aliens. He now had some clout, some Hollywood street cred, I guess you could say. Number nine, the abyss was filmed at an abandoned power plant. Cameron knew that in order to film the abyss, it'll need to be in a controlled environment. Despite initially having an idea of filming it in the open ocean at Florida, which would have been a disaster, and so he knew that he would need water tanks, large ones, as well as creating new technology in which he can communicate with the actors while they were in the tanks. The filming of the movie took place at Gaffney Studios, located in South Carolina, which was an abandoned power plant where two water tanks were created out of the plant's infrastructure. The first was a huge tank constructed out of the plant's primary reactor, and the second was a smaller tank constructed from being a turbine pit. A Canadian diving company would also be brought in to help create new kinds of technology in order to film the abyss. Despite not one single frame of the movie being shot, two million dollars had already been spent, and the construction had already taken over six months. Not to mention the fact that the cast and crew would be having to film in a tank that was previously a power plant reactor. That can't be good, right? Number eight. As soon as the shoot started, there were issues. 
In order to get the cast and crew fully prepared for all the underwater filming, they all underwent diving training at the Cayman Islands. However, by the time the cast and crew turned up on set, ready to do some filming, the main large tank just simply wasn't ready yet, where Cameron then tried to push forward filming to be done in the smaller tank. And at this stage, the shoot was now already one week behind schedule. And what's worse is that when the main tank was ready for filming, it had a leak and lost hundreds to thousands of gallons of water. Now, keep in mind that it actually took five days to fill up the tanks. Experts had to be brought in immediately to make repairs, which were successful to various degrees. In order for the water to look dark and resemble the bottom of the deep sea, no sunlight could get through into the tanks, and so the tanks were painted, as well as a giant tarpauling being put over the tanks. And in addition to that, oddly enough, a ton of plastic beads, which were also used in order to block out light. There was also supposedly a lot of dye used too, in order to get the required colour for the water. And as the filming went on, the water became increasingly stagnant, which would have left the cast and crew open to all kinds of diseases and infections. So the next solution was to use a heap of chlorine, so much so it supposedly could burn exposed skin. <laughs> Yikes! And so, as you can imagine, filming in this movie ocean vomit in a tank that used to be a nuclear reactor was no doubt anything pleasant for all those involved. Number 7. Breakdowns on set The budget and filming delays for The Abyss were really starting to get out of control. So much so, although Wikipedia claims the budget was 43 to 47 million dollars, there are some claims that it was more 70 million dollars, which for the late 80s was just insane. The conditions for filming were truly out of this world. For example, Cameron and the rest of the crew could sink up to 50 feet while filming, and in order to prevent them from getting decompression sickness, they would have to hang from hoses about halfway up the tank, breathing in oxygen, for as long as two whole hours. Yeah, two hours just dangling in a water tank in darkness. It's no secret that the cast in particular really suffered with the abyss, and most of the cast still don't fully feel comfortable talking about it even now. During the shoot, working days lasted up to 16 hours, 6 days a week, in an isolated water tank, with Cameron supposedly telling the cast and crew to just pee in their underwater gear if need be, as taking a toilet break would take too much time. On one occasion, actress Mary Elizabeth Mastrantonio suffered a complete nervous breakdown, with the shoot affecting her both physically and emotionally. And going back to Wikipedia, one night while driving home after filming, Ed Harris just broke down into uncontrollable sobbing. Yeah, this guy was just so broken from filming The Abyss, and it's like the poor guy just couldn't take it anymore. In order to try and cheer themselves up, the cast and crew had some shirts printed up, saying life's abyss, then you dive. A comical reflection on just how awful this shoot truly was. <laughs> but guess what? It gets worse! We've barely even started, baby! If you're already thinking, oh my god, this is pretty bad, well, <laughs> we've barely even started this journey. Number 6. Then Ed Harris nearly died. It seems that even a greater divine power was trying to shut down the production of the Abyss, as one night during a storm, the tank was literally struck by lightning, causing a massive tear in the tarpauling which was covering the tank and creating its required dark atmosphere. So now Cameron had to resort to mainly filming at night. However, all the disasters associated with the abyss would reach fever pitch when Ed Harris was running out of oxygen while in the tank. Now, after signalling for more oxygen, the person who gave him an oxygen regulator actually handed it to him upside down, where water filled his throat. Thankfully, another member of the crew who wasn't an imbecile saw this and fixed up the regulator. 
Later in the movie, we see Harris's bod character have his underwater helmet filled with the breathing liquid. Now, Harris wasn't actually breathing the liquid in, but he was holding his breath. And he had to keep holding his breath while being towed 30 feet down, causing the liquid to go up his nose and into his eyes, which made his eyes swell up. Jeez, no wonder the guy was left in a state of uncontrollable sobbing. Just reading about the making of this movie makes me want to sob too. Incidentally, the rat that we see in the abyss was actually breathing with liquid oxygen. Yeah, it's cool. Number five, the abyss also led to a divorce. James Cameron himself admitted that the abyss was one mean, nasty ass shoot by admitting, quote, I knew this was going to be a hard shoot, but even I had no idea just how hard. I don't ever want to go through this again. If the Abyss shoot wasn't tough enough, it also led to director James Cameron and producer Gail Ann Hurd getting a divorce. Well, okay, it may not be the movie per se that caused them to get a divorce, but by accounts, they separated in the movie's early days of production and were divorced just two months after the shoot wrapped up. And all while they're going through their divorce, they would still be having to see each other and work with each other every day, as James Cameron was the director of The Abyss and Gail Ann Hurd was the producer. So yeah, they had to have a working relationship despite their divorce issues. You know, this really would not have been a pleasant movie to be working on. So much turmoil and hardship. It's actually said that Cameron based the Lindsay character on Herd, which is really awkward because at the start of the movie, we're constantly being told by all the other characters what a B-word the character is. Oh, so yeah, once again, awkward. I guess the character might have been Cameron's creative way of dealing with a real life breakup. God, I hate that bitch. Probably shouldn't have married her then, huh? Number four, we are not animals. One scene that I always found to be quite hard hitting to watch as a kid was the resuscitation scene where Bud tries desperately to save his wife Lindsay from drowning and really gets rough in order to bring her back. Well, apparently while filming that scene, Harris was really hitting and pounding on actress Mary Elizabeth Mastrantonio. So much so, during the filming of that scene, a camera broke. Although some sources claim that it just ran out of film and Ed Harris just kept pounding her. This caused Master Antonio to storm off the set while yelling out, quote, we're not animals. I guess in regards to Cameron's treatment of his cast. Understandably, Master Antonio refused to film that scene again. So for reshoots, Harris was literally shouting at nothing. At one stage, actor Michael Bean was 10 meters deep into the water when all of a sudden, all the lights went out and he was in pitch black and couldn't even see his hand in front of him or even get out for that matter, which sounds honestly really terrifying and actually did make him think for a few minutes that that was it, he was going to die. According to Harris, one day the cast were all in a dressing room and just couldn't take the filming and constant setbacks anymore, where by the sounds of it, the cast lost all humanity and unleashed their raw animalistic side where they threw a couch out of a window and started smashing down walls. <laughs> wow! Both Harris and Mastrantonio have more or less disowned the movie, with Mastrantonio saying, quote, The Abyss was a lot of things. Fun to make is not one of them. Even Harris has said that he'll never talk about the movie ever again. Number three, the special effects helped lead to the creation of Terminator 2. So this exploration into the abyss has been pretty negative so far. So let's talk about positives. Firstly, the score was composed by the legendary Alan Silvestri, and it's amazing. Silvestri had previously scored Back to the Future and Predator, and at the time of scoring the abyss, he had just come hot off the heels of scoring Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Once again, brilliant, 10 out of 10. Also, the special effects of the movie were provided by Industrial Light and Magic, where we see many amazing alien creatures and alien tech. And once again, this is definitely a highlight of the movie, and the effects are undoubtedly superb. When we see one of the alien creatures, they are in liquid form and are also able to morph and even create faces of some of the human characters. 
This was quite the state-of-the-art and experimental effect for its time, a pioneer moment of what was to come. As Cameron was so happy with this effect, he knew that technology had caught up with his visions of Terminator 2. So because of this effect, he knew that he could create the liquid metal T-1000. And so, really, the alien creature in the abyss is actually the genesis of the T-1000 from Terminator 2. Number 2, Special Edition. So by the time an early cut of the movie was put together, it ran at three hours, which put the studio into a panic, as movies that are that long don't get many screenings when released, and thus may be affected in the box office. This meant that Cameron had to make some cuts and edits. So he finally submitted a new cut that stood at two hours and 15 minutes. One scene that was cut from this theatrical version was a scene involving giant waves that the aliens had created in order to stop the human race to constantly be fighting with each other. But thankfully the aliens spare us when they learn of Bud's loving messages to his wife. <laughs> well, that was lucky. According to Cameron, Fox was in shock when they learned that the giant wave was going to be deleted. I guess it was felt that this was a money shot. Regardless, Cameron would eventually release a special edition, which had many of the cut scenes restored, similar to what Cameron would do with, with the Terminator 2 special edition. Now I can remember seeing The Abyss for the first time on a VHS rental with my dad, and it was the theatrical version, and I absolutely loved it. And I just remember it being a great bonding experience with my dad. About 10 or so years later, I bought The Abyss on home video and had no idea that it was the special edition. And the scene with the tidal waves caught me completely off guard. And to be honest, I didn't like it. In the theatrical cut, I always felt the alien race in The Abyss were kind and gentle. I just don't like the idea that they were willing to cause huge big waves in order to kill a lot of people and teach us a lesson. It's like discovering a deleted scene from E.T. where it's learned that E.T. tries to kill the family dog. Yeah, personally, it just doesn't do it for me. But regardless, I guess Cameron's original visions of the aliens was to be less cute and more like the day the Earth stood still, which featured the alien Klaatu, who threatened the world's people with disaster unless we start getting along and stop fighting with one another. But regardless, I do prefer the original cut over the special edition. Number 1. A Box Office Abyss The Abyss was released in August 1989, which was a huge year for franchise movies that was already oversaturated with big blockbuster events. Among all the madness of big movies like Batman, Ghostbusters 2, Back to the Future 2, and Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, The Abyss would make $90 million. So it wasn't a failure, but still probably wasn't as much as anticipated, especially when taking into account the production's ballooning budget. And, well, upon its release it just couldn't compete with the comedy Parenthood. Despite being nominated for four Academy Awards and winning one for Best Visual Effects, The Abyss got mixed reviews from critics. It seemed that critics either really loved it or really hated it. There are those who thought that it was sloppy and a dud, as well as the ending also getting on the critics' nerves, with the New York Times feeling that the movie has four different endings, and by the time we finally get to the final ending, you feel like you've been on a demon roller coaster that you've been stuck on and wanting to get off for quite a while now before it finally stops. However, other critics generally did love it and see it as a candidate for one of the best pictures of the year. And I think in later stages, The Abyss has become something of a forgotten movie in James Cameron's filmography, or at least not as spoken as much. After all, everyone talks about The Terminator, Aliens, Titanic, and Avatar, but not many people stop to remember that sci-fi, underwater sea adventure he made with Aliens. I think it's a shame that the making of The Abyss was such a catastrophe, as in reality, I do think it's a great film, worthy of all the praise that Cameron's other movies tend to get. It is top tier, top of the range filmmaking. Okay, it's a shame that those behind the scenes had to get physically and mentally broken in order for the movie to be top tier, but going by what's presented on the screen, it is a brilliant, awe-inspiring movie. The Abyss is like a long journey, an epic deep dive into the further stretches of the imagination. And by the time the movie wraps up, you feel like you yourself have just been on this heart-pounding adventure. 
For lack of better terminology, the movie itself is almost like its own abyss. So if you have a few hours to spare and are willing to get emotionally invested, then I say definitely check out The Abyss. Anyway, I'm Minty, and damn, James Cameron may be an ass, but he sure does make some awesome movies. See ya!